Shikan. Hello, everybody. My name is Siwu. And my name is Blake. We want to welcome you all to the second panel discussion of the North Country Art, Land and Environment Summit. The topic of this panel discussion is food sovereignty at the time of COVID-19. So with further ado, I will pass the word to Siwu here and uh, they will give the land acknowledgement. To begin, we want to acknowledge the land on which we stand currently. We're where they are all joining us from many places in this region or around the world. However, this summit was organized on Haudenosaunee territory, specifically the land of the Mohawk people. We also want to acknowledge our roles as settlers on this land, acknowledging the role uh, and the violence that was committed by settler populations as they moved in and conquered this territory. In the conquest of Turtle Island, the land was partitioned. This land specifically was partitioned and cut up by multiple empires. Currently, the Haudenosaunee, Haudenosaunee territory is divided between multiple settler borders, the borders of the United States and Canada. Just as the settler communities partitioned this land, imposing their grafts on this soil, also too did settler men, and I'm going to specify men, impose their vision on the way food was grown on this land. And the, instead of having more flowing growth of different plants collaborating and growing together in collaboration with the people that were growing them. Instead, there were straight lines. Everything was divided and partitioned, commodified. So in this conversation about food and food sovereignty, we also must acknowledge that the food that we consume, a lot of it is consumed with this practice, this practice, which is a settler colonial practice. Thank you. Thank you. So on behalf of the North Country Air, Art, Land, Art and Environment Summit, I would like to thank our collaborating partners. These are the people who have helped organizing and uh, of course the land and the water who have made this summit possible. Uh, this program was funded by the Humanities New York with the support of the National Endowment of the Humanities. The St. Lawrence University Arts Collaborative Grant and the Richard F. Brush Gallery. We would also like to thank the North Country Public Radio for being our media sponsor and the Weave News for hosting us tonight. The specific panel uh, is happening in tandem with the Richard F. Brush Gallery exhibition, Water and Origin, uh, honoring the first storyteller. And, uh, and finally, I want to pass the word to Claudia Ford, who is going to be our moderator tonight. Thank you so much to Simu and Blake. Um, and thank you to all of you who are with us. This panel tonight on food sovereignty in the time of COVID-19, it's a really important topic. And we have really exciting panelists here to speak to us about their personal uh, um, experience of this topic. We have gardeners, we have farmers, we have educators, and across the board, we have people who have a very deep spiritual connection to the land, to food, to farming, to agriculture, and really importantly, to their communities. So I know that you will um, get quite a bit out of listening to our speakers this evening. My name is Claudia Ford. I'm an associate professor of environmental studies at SUNY Potsdam. And um, so I am here in Potsdam on unceded Mohawk territory. And I, let's see, I'd go by she, her pronouns. And I've been here in Potsdam for a year. Before that, I was in Rhode Island, 
um, in, in Providence. And before that, I was overseas. So I think I'll leave it at that for my introduction. And I will ask first, Gajit Juni, would you please introduce yourself? Sure. So Sego, Gajit Juni, Young Gats, Wakskaleo, Nuet Gidalo. My name is Gajit Juni, which means she makes flowers. I am from this land, from the Kanyankahaga territories in Akwazasne. And I welcome you to our territories of our people, the Haudenosaunee. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Carmen. Um, I consider myself a Black queer farmer, earth worker. Um, right now, I'm in um, Athol, Massachusetts. This is Nipmuc uh, territory and their ancestral lands. Um, and I'm really happy to be here with all of you all um, and to uh, learn so much from the, the beautiful panel and collection of people that are here. So very happy to be here. Thank you, Carmen. Himani. Hello, everybody. I am um, greeting you from two farms, both of which sit on the lands of the Haudenosaunee. And I am in um, Saratoga County. That's my present location and my future location will be Washington County. Um, I'm a professor at Empire State College and I'm also a farmer and the owner of Squashville Farm with my husband. Thank you. Thank you. And Kat? Hi everyone, um, I'm Kat Bennett, uh, hailing from the Poister, New York, Haudenosaunee Territory. Uh, I work two farms, Milky Tessa Tours and Bitter State Farm as a regenerative agriculturalist. Well, thank you and welcome to all the panelists. One of the, the, the big interests, of course, is we're, we're in the middle of a number of pandemics. Um, we know the, the immediate impact that COVID-19 had starting in the, the early part of this year, January, February, and definitely in March of 2020, we have seen the impact of um, the uh, of systemic and individual cases of racism and the way that has impacted our society. And then of course, the way these two things come together. And there are those who are suggesting we're having a third pandemic um, of climate change. And I want to acknowledge my, my brothers and sisters and family, I have children who live on the West Coast. Um, and I know there are people calling from, from um, Portland, Oregon. And so I really want to acknowledge um, what they're going through right now. And I, I don't know if we can rightfully call all of those things pandemics, but they certainly point to a situation that is somewhat beyond our control and is taking over in a, a manner that is massive all at once, some of the things that we experienced together in March. And so I think what we're about to hear now is about how, how has this affected the food system? What are the, some of the things that we started to notice? Many of us already knew these things about our food system and about agriculture and about our relationship to land. But what are some of the things that we started to notice when COVID-19 came on the scene that we started to notice about food, about land, about farming? And these are the things that our panelists are going to speak to us this evening. So I'd like to invite uh, Gajit Juni to please uh, address us first. I actually did a little PowerPoint uh, presentation just so I could show you some visuals of um, things from our culture and um, from what we do in our family um, when it, with, with regards to agriculture. So I am an artist in the community. I'm also a filmmaker and I'm an educator. I, um, I'm the director of the Title VI program for Native Education at Salmon River School. I'm also a cultural specialist. So I do a lot of teaching in the school and in the community. And so I'm just kind of speaking to you from personal experience and the things that, that, that I'm aware of about agriculture. And um, as far as COVID-19 goes, um, I don't know how much it affected us with regard to agriculture, because we just kept doing what we usually do, which is uh, planting, um, acknowledging our seeds, um, carrying on with 
our ceremonies. I guess that was a little bit challenging, that part. When we had our ceremonies, we had to um, think about the safety of the people when we were doing our ceremonies. And usually there's a lot of people when we meet. So that, that was something that was affected. So I'm just going to go through some of these slides. And then if you have questions for me after, you can. I'm going to share my screen. This is a piece of artwork that's involved with the show that they're doing. And it was done by Yogot Nigul Yosta, um, who's Bear Clan. And it's a reflection of Sky Woman and the creation story and uh, Sky Woman's falling from the earth and, and falling to this water world where she brought with her seeds and roots and also the knowledge of the, the sky beings. And she spread the dirt on the turtle's back and the, the turtle grew into the earth. So in our worldview for us and our creation story, it was a woman that was here first and it was her knowledge that was a catalyst to start the start the earth and start all living things. This is actually an image uh, of an earthworks piece that I did probably 15 or 20 years ago. And when I was listening to our creation story and they talked about Sky Woman having a daughter and her daughter dying during childbirth when she gave birth to twins. And what they said about uh, Sky Woman's daughter is that she placed her on top of the ground and then covered her in earth. And then when she went back to the site where she had left her daughter, um, she noticed all of these plants growing from her daughter's body. So on the, the left-hand side is the shape of um, Sky Woman's daughter. And then on the right-hand side is the, the plants that would have grew out of her body. So out of her head, you see like our traditional tobacco, which is what we use for ceremony. And then from her heart, there's wild strawberries growing from there because our, our heart kind of looks looks like those wild strawberries. And if you squeeze those strawberries, it kind of looks like the blood that our heart pumps around our body. From her breasts grew corn, because that's the main sustenance of our people, just like a mother to their baby. Um, from her belly grew squash. And it's kind of a reflection of, um, of all of us when we're inside of our mother's womb, we're connected to her by that umbilical cord. And if you watch the way squash grows, that's the way it grows, it has those vines that move around and they kind of look like the umbilical cord. And from her fingers grew string beans. And if you look at your hands, they kind of look like, like the shape of string beans. And from her feet grew potatoes. Like when we run around in the summer and we get our feet all covered in dirt, that's how the potatoes look. So this is just an art piece I did as a reflection of that story. But as you listen to me talk, you notice already like the, the feminine energy in our, in our beliefs, in our worldview and in our culture. This one um, is an image on the right that's actually in the exhibit. It's called Onega Su'a, our first home. So for every person, our first home is in the, the waters of our mother. And in our culture, we believe that the women are connected to the moon and the moon controls the water. Our grandmother moon controls the water and she controls when the babies are going to be born. And on the left hand side is a, a picture of one of my latest grandsons that was born. And that's my youngest daughter. So in our culture, when, when a baby's born, they're greeted in our language. And I'm very fortunate that my daughter is able to speak the language. Because I'm not a fluent speaker. So really proud that she can do that. So she greeted, she greeted my grandson. And when they greet them, they, they tell the baby who their parents are. And then they, they, they introduce them to all the natural world. So they, they say to the baby and they say to the earth, this is the baby. And they say to the waters, this is the baby. To the medicines, this is the baby. To the plants, this is the baby. So they, they're able to greet each other. So that's how we start in that way, to establish that connection with everything around us. The roles of women for us, like before European contact, it was the women that were in charge of all agriculture. So it was women's responsibility to plant all of the gardens, and we, we worked together in our clan villages and we would go out together and we would, we would plant all of, you know, fields and fields of corn and beans and squash. And we were responsible for that. And we would get help sometimes from the older men and the children to, to help care for the, the gardens. We did a lot of um, three sisters gardens and, you know, doing mounds and different types of agriculture. And that the role of the women really was affected a lot by colonization. When European people came over here, that was one of the things that I think personally in, in my research and the things that I do, I've noticed that 
they really attacked our women. So they, they see in the women in places of power, like controlling the agriculture is like controlling the economy. Also, our women were in charge of appointing all of the leaders, and they were also leaders themselves. So we had a role in every aspect of our um, being, socially, politically, economically, the women were equal with the men. So that was something that kind of got de deconstructed by colonization. And as a result of things like boarding schools and government policies uh, against, you know, our religion and our way of life. So that really tore down the, a lot of the women's roles. And even like when our, when our pe young people went to, were taken away from their parents and put in these boarding schools, they taught the men how to do agriculture and they taught the women to stay in and do housework. So that was really detrimental to the way that we did things. These are my own photos of my family. So that's my, my Lugany, my father on the left, and he plows up the fields for us. And when we do planting every spring, um, first in our, in our community, we'll have a ceremony for our seeds, acknowledging the seeds and that it's time to plant. And when we plant, our whole family is out there planting and we sing to those seeds. So we have songs that we sing to, to help those seeds to grow. And so we all work together to do that. And we're planting seeds that our grandmothers have passed on to us for generations and generations. We're still planting the white corn. Um, we're still planting our beans. And so we, we pass down those, those seeds to the generations. <laughs> That's my grandson in the bottom left-hand corner just going through the cornfield. Um, so as we're growing, we're, we're also still working together and on the top right is me with my granddaughter and we're in the garden. And then these two things that are on the left, uh, the top one is a three sisters garden. And this is something that I did as part of our summer culture program with the, the youth. Um, we did a program with JOM and our Title VI program and, and I do cultural teachings over the summer. So we planted these three sisters gardens. And on the bottom, the bottom part we have in this, in our school district, we have several of these indoor gardening systems. And so even in my classroom, we're planting um, herbs and lettuce and different things all throughout the year. So we go in and we show the, the young people how to, how to plant. And then especially the little kids get really excited to see little seedlings come up. Like they get so happy to see the little things growing. So those are some of the things we do like in the school. This is uh, some images of harvesting. So on the top left, my grandson and his friend are out there and they're harvesting the corn. And then one of my friends is helping harvest some of our traditional tobacco. And then the other photo is of my classroom. So I teach Native Studies and I also teach um, traditional art. So I, I brought in a big mound, a big pile of corn from my garden and I taught them how to braid it because a lot of them don't have exposure to do that. So it's something we did together, which we won't be able to do this year because of the COVID where like the social distancing and stuff is pretty crazy right now at school. Food is medicine, so this, this shows like a making of the food on the top right. Whenever we have gatherings, um, we, we use a lot of our traditional foods. And of course, for ceremonies, we're using um, the corn and beans and squash for the soup. And so that's incorporated into our ceremonies. That's my granddaughter on the left, and she's eating our green corn. Um, the two, two in the middle are some of my students. I teach them how to make cornbread and corn mush and our traditional foods. And on the right is a tamale that I just made not too long ago. So then my last slide is just about surviving. So the COVID-19 is going on right now, but there's been a lot of things that have gone on for our people and we've survived a lot. So this is just another one of those things that we'll get through and we get through it by, by continuing to, to practice who we are, by continuing to plant the seeds, by continuing to, to teach these things to the younger generation and and that's that's how we do it that's why we're still here i guess this is what i wanted to to share and i hope that you know i hope that i it was helpful for somebody to listen a little bit about our people here it's important to to know your the people that you live next to and to understand and um and be aware and there's a lot of uh good teachings that i think we have that could benefit not only our surrounding communities but the whole world so Nyawa for inviting me and I'm glad to share a few words. Thank you all. Um, um, so beautiful to uh, hear that story and the deep connection. Um, I think for me, um, similarly, 
what's coming up for me during this time is kind of what brought me into the work um, with the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust. Um, and I can't, what, what drew me to that was um, this kind of understanding that's, that's been, I guess, within me about the deep importance of land and the deep importance of being able to connect to land, um, to, to have place, to have space. Um, and in a lot of ways, I guess, um, really being able to, to look at food and what's kind of going on right now um, with COVID-19 in a way where there is not this extractive concept of food and food sovereignty as if it's something that can sustain us alone, but to really look into the connectivity of the whole ecological system um, and our ability to be with the land and to be in relationship is very important. Um, and so I think in a lot of ways, how our food system has reared itself to be um, in the model of um, extraction, capital, wealth, um, being the primary driving force to our current um, models for, for food that um, a broad majority of people are, are, are interacting with. Um, I think this model really is what has um, brought a lot of suffering uh, to people, uh, especially Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities. And so for me, I'm really interested in providing avenues of access to land as a source of um, liberation, as a source of empowerment, to be able to have more um, understanding and connection to the whole process of what we eat and how we are with the land. Um, also, I think with that too, is just like basic needs, right? With, how, with, with land comes a place where there's housing. And um, so just kind of looking at that as the um, foundation. And then I think what came up for me during this time is I'm, I'm in a place where I'm in a rural setting. I'm able to be with the land and I have space. Um, while, while COVID was um, going on, I was able to go outside almost every day um, because you know, social distancing was possible for me. I was able to touch the earth. I was able to feel the fresh air, to, to have water hit my face, um, all of these things. Meanwhile, you know, um, many people in my community, my family um, were in, you know, 600 square foot apartments on third floors and um, having to really face the harshest um, realities of the food system, of um, being pushed and driven into cities. And so at this moment, um, a lot of the work that I'm, I'm doing is trying to create um, community-based networks, bridges between rural landscapes and urban landscapes to work in partnership. Um, a lot of the things that we can offer in rural space as it related to the pandemic specifically um, was a, pay, a, play, a place for people to, to, to breathe, to, um, to touch the earth, to be in open space, to even go outside. Um, and what the, the urban environment often at this point offers um, Black, brown and indigenous people in rural spaces is a place to go back to, to be able to be in space where you're around people who are reflections of you, who are um, able to understand both your spoken and unspoken languages um, and to 
have that connectivity on a face-to-face -face level, which right now, because of how land is dis the distribution of land is not possible for many people of color and indigenous populations in rural spaces. And so this network, um, a community-based network and um, system of um, connection is really, really fundamental to um, us being able to address these type of crises that have come up and also for the long-term well-being of our peoples as a collective. Um, and then I think uh, partnerships, um, as we saw with like the mutual aid that came up, um, establishing these partnerships on land where we have systems that um, we can develop our own childcare systems, our own um, health systems, our own um, ways of being with the land that uplift how we practice. Um, we saw how with, with um, animal meat production, just the, the massive slaughtering of so many animals in ways that really don't connect to our humanity being on the farm, we were able to um, have a slaughter, a goat slaughter, um, that was very, very much ceremony based. It was very much, process, you know, process connected, community based, intimate, and these, this type of ability to be able to enact your cultural um, ways of being with animals, land and food are very much needed. And in order to do so, we have to have space and ability. Um, people who are in urban environments and in cities, they don't really have a choice to have an experience like that and how to do um, an animal slaughter if they should eat meat in a way that's whole to who they are as people. And so um, being able to have that space and invite people out to be a part of that process while on the other end of it, we're seeing just this massive production focused reality play out. Um, it really uh, opened up for me the need to really push for, for uh, access to land and more a, a control as a community in how our food systems play out in ways that resonate with our values and traditions and our practices. Um, and I think lastly with that is just, um, is a call for us to establish a new way of um, looking at our economies and how we interact with food, not in a way of a commodity, not into the land as a way of a commodity, but really changing these um, systems that have perpetuated us um, kind of being marginalized and um, trapped into this produc production cycle. And so uh, through the Black uh, Farmer Fund, um, through other uh, projects where we can go with traditions like the African Susu, where we as a collective shape how we in, engage economically and how we uh, take care of one another. Um, so this is kind of what we're hoping to do with the land trust, knowing that land itself cannot be something that is really commodified or ever owned. And also knowing that there is an immediate need for our people to have space. And what can we do in this time to allow and alleviate for the survival of our people and for the thriving of our people um, ways, pathways for them to have these experiences, um, to be able to share and uplift one another through our skills and knowledge transfer, to uplift our cultural traditions, to um, really bring forward the teachings that we have about the land about how to grow food, how to be in relationship to the plant, the 
and to the whole ecological systems that bring us together. And so um, through the through the land trust, that is that is the goal. And um, I'm really inspired by what I've seen so far um, in the presentation and really looking forward to learning more. So thank you um, for having me. Thank you so, so much. Um, Carmen is someone I work closely with on the Land Trust and the Black Farmer Fund. So I am always so happy to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Uh, may I call on Himani? Hello, everyone. Um, once again, I just want to state my acknowledgement. Um, I greet you from two farms, both of which sit on the lands of the Haudenosaunee. And I greet you tonight as a writer, a professor, a farmer, the daughter of immigrants from India and a self-acknowledged settler. And so the events in America's colonialist history placed my present farm in Saratoga County and racialized protests against our regenerative farming practices have prompted uh, my husband and I to move our farm to land in Washington County. As a settler, I wish to honor the original caretakers of both of these lands and offer the respect to the Haudenosaunee who are here in body as well as in spirit. So Claudia asked us to speak to the title of this panel, Food Sovereignty in the Time of COVID. And because I am a professor in part, I am gonna pull out my academic hat in a few minutes and parse out some terms, um, farmer, food security, and food sovereignty. But first, I'd like to actually say a little more about my farm and the communities we serve. So our farm is Squashville Farm. It's named after the road on which my husband and I currently live. We moved to New York from Seattle, Duwamish lands in 2010 and started the farm as a backyard garden shortly after purchasing our home in 2011. How the garden became a farm has a lot to do with the soil we discovered in the backyard when the snow melted. It was literally dead. The land had been hunting and fishing grounds for the Haudenosaunee and European settlements shifted the use to dairy production until about the mid 1950s when red and white pine cultivation took over to create lumber and paper. Around the 1970s, uh, these industries died out and the land started to become more residential. The wooded areas became uh, full of invasive, um, invasive pines and invasive, um, other invasive brush. Um, the previous owner of our house was a single mother with two boys and one of them rented or borrowed a Kubota tractor and dug out most of the yard to create a racetrack for dirt bikes. And repeated runs over the tracks, bumps, hills, and ditches introduced toxic fumes that had the effect of killing even weeds. So the land was literally dead when we found it after the snow had melted. So I suggested to my husband that we turn the track into a series of winding raised beds. And that's essentially what we did with goat and sheep manure, green manure from an overabundance of zucchini that we planted and hundreds of dollars of bags of topsoil that we poured into the land in that first year. And by the end of 2011, we had renamed the racetrack, the garden circle. And over the years that followed, we began learning that we could rebuild the soil further if we rotated crops and introduced animals. We got chickens, then goats, and later ducks, and then geese. And we began learning that the soil would actually heal on its own if we, didn't, if we just didn't engage in such kind of killing practices as mowing and tilling. So today our backyard is a hot mess of flower and weeds and wild berries that attract bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, and other pollinators. Our gardens produce at least 20 times the amount of food that we ourselves can eat. And our animals provide us not only with eggs and meat, but also with manure that feeds the soil and reduces our reliance on organic fertilizers. 
from our animals and from the land. We get good health, we get vigor, and we get a lot of joy. We donate vegetables and eggs in peak seasons to a local food pantry, a grassroots Black Lives Matter movement, and an assisted living center on our block. We have a small CSA for eggs, and we sell our products at farmer's markets in Saratoga and Schenectady. I coordinate a garden at the local food pantry and facilitate a partnership between the pantry and one of our farmer's markets through which products from the market vendors are brought to the pantry for distribution to elderly and lower income consumers. And so as we grow our farm um, with our move from three acres to 48 acres, we're really looking forward to doing more. So now the academic part, the parsing of terms. Farm. From about 2013 to 2015, I struggled to define ourselves and our land. Was it a garden? Was it a homestead, a farm? I looked up the terms and discovered that the USDA defines a farm in capitalistic monetary terms. A farm is a space where products such as foods are created for the purpose of selling. A farm in essence is a business that seeks profit according to the United States Department of Agriculture. Food security. So when I went up for tenure in 2016, I included a narrative about our farm and the work I was doing with the food pantry and farmers markets. My peer reviewers uh, very nicely commended me for making significant contributions to the food security of Saratoga. So for years thereafter, I used food security to define one of the missions of our farm. About a year ago, I encountered the term food sovereignty. And initially I thought of it as synonymous with food security. Over the past couple of months, I've come to realize that the terms are actually quite distinct and in some ways they're at odds with each other. The United Nations defines food security as the condition of having physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food. The term has been deemed inadequate because it does not stipulate who produces that food and whether the food is provided in a manner that really meets a people's needs. So in a sense, food security is like the notion of tolerance. It's a perpetuation of systemic oppression with a more benign face. Food sovereignty is much more than having a sense of security within a racist and colonialist framework. It's a movement that seeks to actually break that framework. And food is central to that movement because food is much more than something that we eat. It's one's identity, it's one's social relationships, it's one's culture, it's one's health. So where I stand in relationship to these three, com these three terms is a little bit complex. I am a farmer and as such, I am engaged in the trading of foods for money. I might not be in it for profit, but I do recognize that there is a monetary process involved that involves at least covering our costs. And despite the clear inadequacies in the concept of food security, I do wanna help ensure that all the people around me have access to healthy, nutritious food. And I believe in food sovereignty. I see it as a space for learning, alliance building and growth. Food sovereignty in the time of COVID-19. Um, as the two previous uh, speakers have noted, the pandemic has uncovered many realities. Um, one of them is that the corporate food supply chain is weaker than the small farms, the community gardens, and the not-for-profit agricultural entities that it has sought to oppress. When the pandemic hit, groceries didn't have no, enough food because the transport networks that linked corporate foods to corporate stores shut down. The corporate farms had too much food and much of it was dumped. And in the meantime, small farms like ours did pretty well. Not only did we have food, but we had food that people could trust. Only one set of hands is on most of our produce from the time of harvest to the point of purchase. And those hands are mine. So knowledge of how coronavirus spreads via personal contact and touch actually motivated more people to visit farmers markets for their weekly goods. 
And in a sense, I actually want to suggest that this is food sovereignty at level one, a very, very basic low level. Some control over the food one eats through being a farmer and some control over the food one eats through knowing the farmer from where the food comes. And that relationship has always existed. During the pandemic, it became more apparent. Yet with the pandemic, there's also been two more somewhat grim effects. As the more affluent consumers grab local foods, there's a risk of less being available to those who need it. And there's also the backlash to success. As um, Black, Indigenous, people of color farmers and other producers create structures of resilience, such as gardens that become entrepreneurial farms, the white majority feels a threat and they lash out. And in a sense, that is actually why we're moving Squashville Farm from one place to another. Last Sunday, my husband and I went to our new land to bless it. In the house, which sits literally on the Hudson River, as is evidenced in its very wet basement, we offered halwa, a sweet dish used in Hindu rituals, and water from our current well. Outside in the fields, we offered crops from our current land that evoke um, both lands past and nourish its future, corn, squash, and beans. And we look forward to working the land, and we look forward to allowing the land to work on us. So thank you all so very much for listening. Thank you so much, Shimini, for that. Wow. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask Kat if you would be our final presentation for the panel. Kat? Um, so I'll start with a small explanation of myself and uh, the land that I work with. Uh, and then I'll try to be brief and but move into how COVID has affected us um, and what changes we've seen. Uh, so 20 years ago, my family and I had to move from the mountains of Maine, where my mother's family had been located for over 500 years, um, to northern New York. Uh, we were running from industrialism. A television tower was being built behind our house. Um, and there was really no way out and land prices were too high. So that's why we came here. We got here and um, the land, like has been mentioned by other presenters, uh, was just barren, um, really destroyed by dairy that had started out small and gotten bigger. And uh, so I've been incredibly blessed to watch my parents over the past 20 years learn how to help uh, the ecosystems rejuvenate uh, we now have dozens of threatened species uh, that we both cultivate and simply provide sanctuary for. Uh, and in providing sanctuary for those threatened species, we've also uh, incorporated human sanctuary into our farms. Uh, so we have a community supported agriculture um, system that nobody else in our area is doing. It's entirely uh, labor-based, it's not monetary-based at all. It's the first in our area um, to do that. And we uh, have taught thousands of students, thousands of people of all different ages, um, people from uh, youth program centers. We welcome new employees on a regular basis. We try as hard as we can to create our farm as not just uh, a community center, but in a holistic ecological community center. So then when I graduated um, from St. Lawrence University in 2016, uh, through <laughs> some interesting routes, I began my own small potato farm, milkweed chestnut tubers, uh, utilizing my parents' land or the land where my parents live and um, living right nearby. And it's been amazing to me how much I've managed to learn in this, just the four short years that I've been growing potatoes as compared to all the many years I spent watching my parents. Uh, I work specifically with varieties that were developed uh, on my road 75 years ago, but I'm one of the last people growing them. And I'm working to help restore those varieties as well as other potato varieties that are incredibly threatened by climate change right now, um, that on the West Coast have been frozen out and they're almost disappearing. Uh, for me, that's been 
so very, very exciting. Um, and I'm also trying to move into more native root crops so that I can learn about how to incorporate my agricultural practices into the ecosystem uh, in a way that is more recognized by the greater um, society. Uh, right now, everyone knows potatoes, but very few people around here know blue potatoes and very few people around here know ground nuts or do some artichokes uh, or any of the other foods that could be so abundant um, here. And so I really feel that my job at this point, working with my parents and working with community members is actually working for the land. Um, I was thinking about this so much last night, trying to prepare for the panel, and I realized that the land is really my boss, um, which is something I'd never put words to, but I was able to uh, articulate more. I walk out and I try as hard as I can to really listen to what's going on. Where do the trees need to be planted? What's going on with the insects? Um, how many hummingbirds were born this year? Uh, because I feel that right now, um, as a young person, as a young woman, uh, regenerative agriculture is what I what I should be doing. Um, it's the most effective means to uh, holistically restore ecosystems while providing food for a multitude of species, um, including humans. Uh, and so, looking at that um, in light of COVID, in many ways, has been incredibly terrifying. Uh, as a small farmer, I'm well aware of the horrendous setup of our industrial food train, um, but it's been so interesting seeing the rest of my community wake up and see that too. We are getting calls on a very regular basis, uh, people asking if we have meat for sale, people asking if we have piglets for sale, the number of people on my road who have suddenly decided they're going to become pig farmers is uh, enormous. and. <laughs> mildly humorous because most of them don't actually know what pigs look like. <laughs> but it's really, really interesting um, and in many ways and heartwarming to see how many people, whether they quite know what they're doing or not, are really trying to get back um, to the soil. Our CSA membership skyrocketed this year and even now in October, we're still getting requests as it comes to a close. Um, and I find that I, like I said, I find that heartwarming, but at the same time, I actually have found COVID to not be nearly as much of a threat um, to myself, to the community, um, or to my work as climate change. So we're talking about one pandemic, and for me, my low level anxiety comes entirely from another sort of pandemic, as you mentioned, Claudia. Um, I wake up terrified of frost early in the season and uh, the enormous drought we had. And so for us at Bittersweet and Milkweed Tussock Tubers, we are just striving to learn what traditional um, or older practices or new practices are out there that we can incorporate uh, that will help us maintain our resiliency against climate change. Um, and that's where the listening of it to the land comes in. I've learned so much about water retention <laughs> this year because we had such a big bout that if I hadn't been farming in a regenerative fashion, all of my crops would have just collapsed. It would have been next to impossible um, to do any sort of food production. And that's what I'm hearing from other farmers who work in different fashions um, that they just are not able to produce the way that they were. And so for us, uh, we're trying to teach that too, getting as many people on the farm learning about uh, what needs to be done and how it needs to be done in order for us to maintain any semblance of a healthy human existence and not just maintain a semblance, but really build a new world. And that's where I've gotten to at this point is uh, the fear is gone, and now it's just time to keep moving. Beautiful words for us to end on. Carmen, I was wondering if you could just um, expand a bit upon um, like the mission of the Northeast Farmers of Color um, Land Trust. Um, yeah, so that's a big one. <laughs> I think it's probably a, a, um, about as di diversified as, a, as the people who make it up, right? Because 
um, that's pretty much what his fundamental purpose is, is to create a space where um, what you bring can be uh, enacted upon. So it's about what what is the necessity of the people. Um, I think overall we have like these concrete goals of like, you know, um, 20,000 acres and like um, wanting to be able to create uh, leases for like maybe 50 farmers within the first couple of years. We have these like landmark um, goals, but I think as far as the purpose um, the purpose herself for it is to work in some ways in tandem with a system we know is not meant for us. <laughs> and while acknowledging that, knowing that we have people who are in a place of needing space to create that opening for us to establish something new to establish something counter to what we know has not and will not work for us. So in many ways, it is a, it's almost a, a bridge um, to create that. And that's going to show up for some folks in the need of rest. When I, when I look at the, my ancestors who um, <laughs> who farmed some who you know were brought here against their will, enslaved in South Carolina. <laughs> and, um, and I think about all these years of just back breaking work and labor that my people have not known what it is to rest. <laughs> they haven't known what it is to maximize their cre creativity um, to what, what, what can come to be if you are allowed space to allow your mind to take you the places you want to go. Um, I think uh, for a lot of times we've been trapped in this mode of survival that the space just to create and dream has eluded us. So that's one aspect. The other is a space to be able to share our deep knowledge that we've carried through our ancestors and that we have carried in our abilities to survive. That's deep wisdom. And so how do we begin to create space where we can see and bring people together on land that is held and protected to allow that type of sharing to go on so that skill share opportunity, that knowledge transfer. And then um, to look at how we care for the land, how we connect to it. Um, the practices that we we interact with the land, um, the connection we see ourselves in it, and the ability to break away from what we have been taught as agriculture, <laughs> and into um, a more ecological understanding of it, um, and to care for it in these ways that that um, are more true to our traditions. And um, I guess the other piece is to to keep in mind where we are and the lands that um, when we think about when we think about where we are, we cannot deny that um, the indigenous peoples cared and cultivated for this space. So that is the foundation of all interaction is that conversation, centering that knowledge, centering that understanding and figuring out in a collaborative process, how do we come or overcome all of our um, oppressions and enter into our collective liberation? So that's what it is for me. <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you for that, <laughs> Carmen, for that answer and that question, Derek. I see in the chat, there's a question um, that really speaks to something that you just said, Carmen, and that I know Gajit Juni said very clearly um, from River. I would be interested to hear the panelists discuss the role of intergenerational knowledge transfer in building agricultural resilience. So I'd like to uh, open that to any of the panelists who'd like to speak about that. I know uh, Gajit Jenny, you've begun to talk a little about that 
and of course shared your beautiful photographs of your multi-generational family. Perhaps you can start us off. Sure. I think it's really important that we're passing down this knowledge to the next generations and we do it in our family um, with our gardening practices and the knowledge of our ceremonies and and, and in those ways we do that. But I also as an educator, educator in school, um, it's something that I try to incorporate into the classrooms. Um, just even thinking about where food comes from. You know, when I'm teaching, like when I do the indoor gardens with the little kids and I'm talking about food, I bring in different items for them to look at and, and think about where do those seeds come from. And then I talk about organic food versus, you know, food you get in the grocery store. And I think a lot of them don't even think about those things. I think a lot of people in general don't think about that, like a lot of the stuff that's on their foods that they consume. So in this small setting, when we're planting any of those indoor gardens, at least, um, we're using organic soil, we're using organic seeds. Um, and so I said, I tell them when you eat this food, when it's done, you know that there's no chemicals on it and it's uh, all good, everything that you're putting in your body. So it is important to do that. And I, and the kids get so excited by that. I mean, I, I just love going in there and seeing them just smiling, watching those little plants come up and they're like, Miss Fox, my plant came up and they're, you know, they're all excited. And, and then the same for the family. I mean, that's, it's a, it's a way of building um, family connections. It's a way of building community connections when you're, when you're working side by side with your family and you're, you're picking beans and you're talking and, and they're learning how to sort the beans out and how to dry them and and you know, it's it seems like it's work you know looking at it from the outside but really it's a way of, of uh, building building relations and building family and building connections to that food so those are just uh i guess what i have to offer in my own experience here and i i have to say i really enjoyed listening to everybody talking it's real encouraging um all the people that are out there planting and that's one thing I forgot to mention when I was um, when I was presenting earlier is that's one thing I noticed in our community is that more people started to plant as a result of um, what was going on with COVID. And not just because they're worried about where to get their food, but because they were able to slow down and have the time to do it. Because everybody is so like in this fast paced kind of rat race and not having the time to not taking the time to do you know to connect in those ways because we're so busy working and doing and doing other things so that was that was something that i thought was a really positive outcome from the whole covid thing was that people slowed down and and reconnected and planted more gardens which was very cool <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree there, Gaj Juni. And that kind of goes into another, we're starting to get some questions. This is an interesting question that kind of follows from what you said from Lily. Um, it seems every week there's a new recall of fresh vegetables due to bacterial contamination. What do you ascribe to the weak U U.S. food supply chain? Has the U.S. government reduced inspection of food how can I feel comfortable eating salad again? And I think we, we did start to talk about that part of the weakness in our food system. Um, Himini, perhaps you, you, you had begun to talk about that when you talked about how your CSA members appreciated all of a sudden that it was your hands that was touching this food. Um, can you address that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that COVID really um, sort of woke, woke us up to was the idea. I mean, we have these statements, you know, that food travels an average of 1500 miles um, to get from the farm to the grocery store. Whereas the food that comes to you directly from a farm via farmer's market or a CSA, um, you know, maybe travels 20 miles or less. And one of the things that COVID helped us see was that many, many hands touch that produce as it's going from the farm to the um, processing center, to the distribution center, to the warehouse, to the shipping facility, loading onto the truck, transported across, uh, maybe transferred again, unloaded, 
moved into the warehouse for the grocery store and then brought out. And as you think about the number of hands that um, land on the food and the packaging and the aging that the uh, food itself undergoes through that process, it's not a surprise that um, there would be um, contamination of some sort. And I do think that that is kind of the weakness in the food supply chain. I don't know whether inspections have been reduced. I can't really speak to that. Um, but, you know, um, to e be comfortable eating salad again, uh, visit your farmer's market or uh, visit your farm stand or um, salad. Lettuce is not that hard to grow and, you know, give it a try. You know, failure is one of the best teachers. And I can say as in 10 years of farming, I've had lots of lessons from failing. Yeah, and I can say this year, um, I, I don't have a, a garden space. So I did my first container garden and I got food out of my little um, uh, cardboard boxes. I found some non-toxic cardboard boxes and I grew food that way up on my porch. And yeah, it, it was great. Um, and when there were some recalls of onions, um, and I think we've struggled the whole season with that, um, I made sure I was getting onions from the CSA, again, because of knowing whose hands that touched that food and being really clear um, what the food supply chain was. So thank you for answering that question. I see we do have in the Q&A uh, a question for Kat. Can you tell us a little about conserving the diversity of potatoes you are growing? Do you feel that there is enough local adaptation and resilience to ensure potato security in the North Country? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> no, that's a good question. That's something I think about a lot. Um, I feel as though I've actually been a little disheartened growing so many varieties of potatoes in the North Country because most people are so familiar with just your white, maybe your red um, from the grocery store. So I'm striving to grow all of these oddball varieties, um, some of which made it uh, directly from South America up to North America without even moving to Europe. Uh, and people are very, very excited, but nobody quite understands why it's important to be rescuing potatoes. They're potatoes. They're every day. They're common. Um, they don't understand that uh, if you go down to the Andes, to Chile and Peru, where people are really growing their potatoes the same way that they've been doing it for thousands of years, there's almost 6,000 varieties down there. And not a single one of them is genetically modified. It's all through just traditional seed saving practices. Um, specifically in the North Country, I'm finding that those Andean varieties are way more resilient towards our uh, droughts and our floods. Um, there are certain European varieties that are more resilient to our cold springs. It's really a matter of choosing which varieties you know are going to adapt well. There's a lot of varieties um, that are considered really, really common, like russets, that I have absolutely no luck with. I can't grow a russet to save my life, but I can grow uh, maca ozette really, really well, which are from Washington State um, and traditionally grown by the maca people. and. Uh, they do fantastic for me. Or um, the garnet chili, which was actually developed down in Rochester, so not that far from here. I think when you're choosing a food source that is not originally from your landscape, um, you really have to get to know that food source. Ecologically, it would probably be easier to grow Jerusalem artichokes uh, because they're from this area. And I like Jerusalem artichokes and I'm working on reviving some of the rarer varieties, uh, but they don't sell as well. <laughs> so that's where the commodification of food comes in. So if you're going to pick something that's, uh, that's different, yeah, you just get to know that plant, um, whether it's potatoes or tomatoes or onions, there is an amazingly fast change that a plant can undergo um, to become regionally adapted. It does not take very many years. 
uh, they found um, certain potato varieties after under two decades, they can find that they're genetically different from the original uh, strain that those seeds came from. Um, yeah, specifically with potatoes. And if I, if I may uh, quickly jump back to the next question, I hope I answered the potato question thoroughly. Inspections by the USDA have not halted, but it should be noted that uh, food inspectors are few and far between. There's nobody who wants to do it. Um, it's not exactly a, a job anybody enjoys. My potato inspector is responsible for three counties. Um, and as you guys are aware, our counties are enormous. Um, so that's one man covering thousands and thousands of miles. Uh, and in terms of uh, salads, it, yeah, go to your local farmer because you know exactly what they're doing. But I would say take it a step further. Don't just go to the farmer's market. Go to the farm. Ask the farmer what they're doing. Learn from them. Um, because at this point in time, the practices being used uh, on industrial farms, uh, they're just getting more and more desperate as climate change gets worse and worse. And that's one reason we're seeing more and more contamination. Uh, the manure that's being used as fertilizer is not sterile. It's coming from unhealthy cows, things like that. Um, Thank you for that, Kat. Um, I see two questions I'd like to take. One very briefly, and then the, the last one um, I'd like all the panelists to answer. So I'm thinking um, maybe um, Himani, um, there's this question about choosing seeds, securing um, seeds from, you know, from your own plants or from seed distributors, and what methods work best for you um, and, you know, going from season to season in terms of your seeds. W would you like to answer that? I'll start, but I'd really like to toss the ball to Katja Kani. I think she would have some more knowledge of it. Um, I'm hoping that with our move to a larger farm, I'll be able to do more seed saving. Um, right now, the primary seed that I save is um, for a plant that it's a squash that's called bitter melon or Karela. And it's um, something that um, is used quite a bit in Indian cuisine and the seeds are not readily available. And I have found actually that the few times that I have ordered seeds, they haven't germinated well. So it's really much uh, better to save my own seeds in that case. And that's kind of the main one I've tried so far. Um, I use um, I use three primary sources for my um, for my other seeds. Um, one is the Hudson Valley Seed Company. They're um, a local seed company just about three hours or not even three hours, about two hours south of me and um, certified organic. Um, I also use Johnny Seeds, which is, um, you know, it's a worker owned cooperative, a fairly big seed distributor out of Maine. Um, and I use um, High Mowing as well. They are a um, organic um, seed company out of either Maine or Vermont. Um, most of the seed companies that I use have taken the non-GMO pledge. So I know that the seeds are um, non-GMO. Most of them are organic certified. So those are my primary sources. Um, I also do actually work with um, like a local gardening store and um, choose from some of the local seed companies that they um, that they um, provide um, that they provide in their stores. So that's sort of my answer. But I'd love to hear what others have to say because this is something I want to learn more about. Great, thank thank you for that. And there isn't some national. There are some national seeds distributors. I know I do some work for one um, that helps me get seeds up here to the North Country. So um, definitely feel free to get in touch with me if you want to hear more about that. Um, I'm looking at time, and I think um, I would actually like to go to a question that everybody can address in turn. Um, and so um, if we do have time, we'll, we'll come back to seeds. But I'd like to, I think that River 
has asked a really interesting question or a series of questions. Um, I'm interested to hear how you all think these ideas of food sovereignty and agricultural resilience can be made accessible to all people. Um, and then this, the follow-up question was, could the panelists speak to how their gender identity has influenced them in agriculture? So those are two interesting questions. I'm gonna put them both kind of on the table um, and ask any of you to, uh, to speak. Who would like to start? I'll, I'll jump in on the food sovereignty. I, I think that as people, as individuals, anybody can do like what you did and do container gardens and start food sovereignty right there in your own house. You know, even if you're living in a city, you can do that. So those are those are acts of food sovereignty. And myself, I, I really get a thrill when I when I'm eating a dinner that had nowhere to do with a grocery store. <laughs> So I'm eating and it's just corn and potatoes from my garden. And I actually, our farmer's market had some of those purple potatoes that she was talking about and they were really good. So for me, it's about nutrition. It's about, um, and, and shopping locally is important. I think that's, you know, that contributes to food sovereignty when you're shopping from your own community and you're empowering the people that are planting those foods. And you know that's more nutritious because it hasn't traveled very far and it's come from the earth right here. You, you know what's been put on it. So all of those those small things add up. And even like if all of us just plant a little bit or do a little indoor gardening, every little bit helps and, and that we acknowledge and know where our food comes from. So those are acts of food sovereignty. Thank you, Juni. And yeah, I was very careful. I sprayed mine with biodynamic preparation, my little container garden. I prayed over the seeds. I mean, literally, they were cardboard boxes, but they made beautiful veggies. And I had that same experience when I made a meal that I had grown myself. Uh, that was definitely food sovereignty. Um, Carmen, did you want to speak to this idea of accessibility to all people or the other question about gender identity? I'll do my best to um, do both. Um, I don't know if I'm on the right view or not. <laughs> but, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I hope y'all can see me. Um, okay, so yeah, I'll do my best to answer both. I think for me, uh, most immediate, it's connected to uh, dignity. And so I think, yeah, uh, food sovereignty is always the ability to be able to um, grow something for yourself, for your community, to be with that plant and to see it. And yeah, to have that gratification of it being on your plate and, and feeding those that you love and you care for and you know the heart that's in it. Um, I think on a community base, ultimately food sovereignty is for a community to be able to um, to have a say in how food comes about through that community. Who's allowed to come in? Who's allowed to shape it? Um, we have to, for me, um, many people in, in the community where I grew up face, uh, even if they make it to the grocery store, is in um, they're not treated with dignity. You're asked to put your bag up. Um, you're not treated in, in uh, full personhood. Um, so for me, those things are tied, a community shift and um, the ability to uh, do what you can in your own space to, uh, to bring something to your plate to nourish your family and yourself. And for me, how does gender, my gender identity show up? Um, that's big as a, as a, as a, a black queer, um, person, it became really important for me to look for a space where I could allow my identities to fully show up. And so having access to land, having access to um, space um, to allow the traditions of my great grandmother who, who worked with land to, to relive itself in me as a queer person on the land and to be able to create that space for um, folks who identify similarly to have space and community um, and in the food system was a 
that's that's something that's really important to me. So that's how it shows up. Thank you, Carmen. Cat uh, or Himani? Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Hmm. Let me gather my thoughts for a minute. I guess when I think about food sovereignty being accessible to all people in my area, it feels incredibly daunting, um, <laughs> which I'm sure it does to everybody. But uh, I do live in a very conservative area, uh, so even more so than I think other people have access <laughs> to more diverse regions. Um, but I'm looking at the Declaration of Nilini's um, definition of food sovereignty, and it really it talks about people's right to define their own food and ag systems, um, putting their aspirations first. So food sovereignty in and of itself, of course, is meant to be accessible to all people because it means food is accessible to all people. Um, on a small and personal scale, I see that as, as the CSAs, but the non-monetary CSAs, as getting the people onto the farm, the education. Education is huge. Um, not just educating people about how to do something, but why to do something. Why do we need to reconnect with the soil? Why do we need to respect the waterways? Um, and I would love to be able to do all of that uh, in a world that we create that does not have the interference of uh, laws and government that are deliberately working against us. Um, but we don't have a lot of time so one thing I look towards, personally, I would love to just abolish all the horrible laws in the industrial food chain tomorrow. Just snap my fingers and it's gone. And then it's accessible for everyone, no problem. But like I said, we're running out of time. So I look at um, other countries' examples of bringing small food into their people. Um, I look at villages and towns that have created their own laws. Uh, Maine created a Food Sovereignty Act, which means you can now sell food from your home, which believe it or not, was illegal for a very long time. Even my seeds for potatoes, I'm not allowed to sell some of them as seeds right now because I don't have any sort of paperwork backing where they came from um, because they were never given to a university or anybody with gov government backing. They were just developed on my land. Um, so looking uh, at places like Austria, where instead of giving stimulus packages to industrial farmers, they give them to the 86 year old who has two cows, but she knows how to make cheese. And so they help keep her at a living wage so that she can teach others to do what she's doing. Um, things like that. Um, in terms of gender, I really, I, I'm able to laugh at this point because uh, the ETC group does a yearly review called Who Will Feed Us? And what they found is that 70% of the world's food is produced 70, by 70% 70 of the world's farmers. And the majority of those people are women living in poverty on three hectares or less. And they don't have land in their name. And most of what they produce is either sold at small markets um, or it's simply fed to themselves and their neighbors. Uh, but so the reality is, is that for me, my gender um, is a point of strength. It's also a point of contention because on my road, which is uh, primarily Amish and highly patriarchal, even more so than this country we live in, uh, people question that I even own my own house. I had to change my name on my mailbox so that it actually had my full name spelled out because people thought C. Bennett meant my brother had purchased the house. I had to put Pat Bennett. Um, but I, at this point in time, I'm using my gender as a tool. It's allowing me uh, to walk into a lot of doors um, that 10 years ago weren't open because there are more people now who want young women who are farming or want young women to speak up. Um, the movements we've seen in society, the Me Too movement um, has helped push anybody who doesn't identify as male more into the forefront. Um, and I, I'd like to hope that we're gaining power. So I think my gender is an asset. Unfortunately, for most people in my position, it really is not. Um, the number of uh, farms um, actually owned by women is very, very 
small so they don't get the recognition um, despite the fact that if you walk through a farmer's market, the number of stands run by women is uh, enormous. Um, you're not hearing a lot of uh, voices um, from outside the white male uh, culture. You look at a panel, a panel five years ago on food sovereignty like this one would not have been made up of who it's made up of today. Uh, even NOFA New York, the Organic um, Farming Association of New York, I'm often disappointed by the number uh, of men who are in charge of the, the speeches and the uh, workshops, because I feel like they could do a little bit more. Um, and I guess just to tie it together, I think about specifically, uh, I'm a big fan of Rowan White's work and um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I love the term rematriation. And for me, being able to hear somebody talk about bringing seeds back to the women in, in a culture uh, has been very powerful. So I think that having more women involved in food is exactly where we need to go to make food accessible to everybody. It's really the only way. We're already doing all the work. We just need the recognition and somebody to get out of the way so that we can keep doing our jobs. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Kat. And thank you for bringing Rowan into the space and the incredible work that Rowan White does. If you don't know, please, uh, if you Google Rowan White, um, her, her work in community, her seed saving, all of that will come up. I would like to just offer such a deep thanks to our panelists, to Gajit Juni, to Carmen, to Himani, to Kat, your, your generosity and your graciousness with which you have shared um, your wisdom. You've been, your words have been so thoughtful. I can really say of the many panels that I have been on, this one has been the most thoughtful. And the, your wisdom obviously comes from your hands and from your hearts. And that's really what I have seen this evening and heard in your words. So I am so deeply grateful. And I know that the people listening are also grateful for what you have offered us. We're in a time where COVID-19 and um, racial oppression and, and, and climate change, what we need is revolutionaries. And what we have tonight, as we're looking at all of you, uh, you are revolutionaries and you are building this revolution right from where it should be built, which is from, from Mother Earth, from the land itself. So a deep thanks, deep gratitude to all of you for what you have offered us this evening.